Good evening. I can tell you now that there is no better song to come out to. Welcome to the first Amazing Facts Youth Conference. Are you excited to be here? Really? Are you, are you excited to be here? Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. I think that this, uh, this, this very long weekend is going to be uh, such a blessing. I encourage you to try and come to all the meetings. Uh, there's going to be some amazing speakers. Uh, we've got Adam Ramden. We've got Clifford Goldstein, David Shin, Carlos Munoz, uh, myself this evening. And then there's um, the pastor of, of this place. What's his name again? Doug Batchelor, yes, yes. Um, Doug Batchelor will also be speaking, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, I have the privilege of starting this conference off and uh, delivering the opening message. And so I just want to uh, pray and ask that the Lord would be here and be with me and give me the right words to say. Can you join me with that? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray humbly asking for your spirit. Lord, you are a good father. And you've told us that you desire to give us good gifts, and nothing can be better than receiving your Spirit. We ask that he would find a place in our hearts and in my lips. Use me, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have you ever wanted something so incredibly badly that when it actually came, you just couldn't believe it? I think of Abraham and Sarah as they waited and waited and waited for a firstborn son. And when the promise was given, they couldn't believe it. For as long as I can remember, at least, um, I've desired, looked forward to the day immensely when I would eventually become a father. And now my wife is pregnant with our firstborn son, and she's in that stage that stage of pregnancy. I call it the prophetic stage of pregnancy uh, because for the woman that is carrying the child, every day feels like a year. And we are, we are looking forward uh, for the day when he comes. We dream of these things. We pray for great things. And it oftentimes we're found shocked when those prayers are answered, when those dreams are realized. I've at least found that when we try and accomplish our own dreams in our own strength and they actually come true, it's usually because we have dreamed far too small. God does not dream small. It may be a little strange for you to think that God even dreams at all. But what I mean by that is God, once upon a time, had this lofty, ambitious, fantastical idea that one day Israel would become the greatest nation on the earth. He believed that this place would become an epicenter for righteousness, that all the world would pass through, and that no man would need to tell his neighbor, but all would come to a true knowledge of God. Now, for this to take place, God needed a people. And you know the story. He calls Abraham out of his family's idolatry and makes him a promise in Genesis chapter 12. He then reiterates this promise, of course, to him in Genesis chapter 15, that his seed would go on to be a great nation and, and bless, bless the entire earth. This promise is then passed down into Isaac in Genesis chapter 26, further passed down to Jacob in Genesis chapter 28, and reiterated throughout time as a reminder that God is going to do something truly amazing. However, due to every fault of their own, the Israelites are then enslaved by the Egyptians for how long? For 400 years. Right until Moses comes and frees them with the help of God and the plagues, and again, you know the story. And in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 31, that promise is once again reiterated. There is a land, a heavenly land, which you are going to possess. Go forward. And all they have at this time, all the Hebrews have, is they have the promise of God. That's all they have. I think back to, to the Garden of Eden when all Adam and Eve had was a promise. They had a promise from God 
no evidence, just a promise that if they were to eat from this forbidden tree, what would happen? They would surely die. Satan had this counter promise. No, no, no. If you do eat from this tree, you will become wise. You will become like gods. And so they stand here in the middle having to choose between which promise it is they're going to believe in. Of course, at that time, 100% of the earth's population is satanic, if you will, aligned with the ideas and the morals and the thoughts of the deceiver of men. The promises of God are all the Israelites had. The promises of God are all you and I have. And the promises of God are all that we will ever need. Man should not live by what? By bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so if you turn to Numbers chapter 13, we get to what is arguably the most pivotal point in Israel's entire history. You could say that if they get this right, there might not have been a Babylonian exile. If they get this right, there might not be a destruction of Jerusalem. If they get this right, there's a chance that they'll actually recognize the Messiah when He comes. And here's the thing, and the adults here will know all too well, that you don't get to the pivotal points of life and just coast right through. These are designed to be testing times, times of crisis, times when, when true characters are revealed, times when faith is pushed to the utmost. And so God speaks to Moses at the beginning of Numbers chapter 13 and tells him, go and get your best men. Go and get the leader of each tribe. And let's go and do something. Let's go and survey the land. And we're going to get a man from each tribe so that when they come back, no one can point the finger and say, your tribe said this and my tribe said that. Everyone can listen to their own leader. And so in Genesis chapter 13, it gives us the list of the men that were chosen. It says, from the tribe of Reuben, there was Shamua. From the tribe of Simeon, there was Shaphat. From the tribe of Judah, there was Caleb. From the tribe of Issachar, there was Egal. From the tribe of Ephraim, there was Oshea. And by the way, if, you're, um, if, you, if any of you have Irish heritage, now you know which tribe you came from. Uh, you came from Ephraim, because Oshea is one of the most popular Irish names out there. From the tribe of Benjamin, you have Palti. From the tribe of Zebulun, you have Gadiel. From the tribe of Joseph, which is the tribe of Manasseh, you have Gadi. From the tribe of Dan, you have Amiel. From the tribe of Asher, Setur. From the tribe of Naphtali, you have Nachbi. From the tribe of Gad, you have Guel. All of these men chosen, picked to be leaders, to go out as spies to survey the land, to come back with a report to encourage the people of God. Now, I want you to look at verse 16 here in Numbers chapter 13. It says, these are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Oshea, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. What we would then be told later is Joshua. So, so right before they go out, there's this curious name change that seems somewhat out of the blue. Joshua, formerly called Oshea, is told by Moses that actually we're going to call you something else. Now here's the thing, there's something special and yet quite common also about name changes happening in the Bible at pivotal moments of history. We have Abraham and Sarah's name being changed, we have Jacob's name being changed to Israel. You might know that you and I, when we make it to the kingdom, will also be given a new name. But this is one that we don't spend a lot of time looking at, the fact that Joshua wasn't always called Joshua. Why does it matter? And why specifically does it happen here? Well, let's read on. It says from verse 17, Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains. And see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests there or not. Be of good courage, 
and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now, this is the first time in the Scriptures that the word courage is ever used. You may have heard of the law of first mentions, which simply states that when something is mentioned for the first time in the Scriptures, it is usually there and then that the meaning of that thing is most clear and most simple. If you think back to Genesis chapter 22, looking at the word worship, that's the first time the word worship ever comes up, is in Genesis chapter 22, verse 5. And Abraham said to the young men that were with him, stay here, I and the lad, being Isaac, are going to go yonder and worship. And what? And worship. And we shall come again unto you. Now what had Abraham actually been told to do to Isaac? To sacrifice him. Great. He'd been told to sacrifice him. But what does Abraham actually call that? He calls it worship. Because for Abraham, the two are synonymous. There is no worship where there is no sacrifice. Are you with me? And so when we're introduced to worship, we're introduced to this idea of sacrifice. This is the first time that worship is mentioned. After all, if there was no sacrifice, what on earth would we be worshiping? So be of good courage. In context, Moses is telling the 12 spies, especially Joshua, formerly Oshea, to be courageous because they are about to face something whereby if they don't meet it with courage, they will instead be extremely discouraged. He's essentially giving them a, a pep talk before they go out. I believe in the canvassing circles, uh, this is called a rah-rah. You guys ever done one of those? Kind of stand in the middle and you sing and, and dance and bounce to a little beat, and then you all jump into a white van and head out and try and sell some magazines, right? That's not exactly what they were doing here. Um, but, 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 but you get the point. Moses here is, is telling him, hey, hey, listen, be of good courage. Be of good courage. Now, What's the point of telling someone to be of good courage? Students, have you ever, you ever been studying for, like, you're getting ready for a final, or rather, this is what usually happens, the final just shows up, and you're like, oh, and, and in the meantime, you know, you know, you haven't really studied, and you haven't prepared, and then one of your professor comes up and, you know, taps you on the shoulder and says, you got this, except you know that you don't, <laughs> right, because you haven't studied. So, them tapping you on the shoulder and saying, you've got this, what does that do for you? It does nothing, right? It doesn't, it doesn't change your mind, and now you think, oh, actually, I do got this. They just tapped me on the shoulder. I must have this. You think, I don't have this. Being told you've got this, being told, hey, you know, just be courageous, that doesn't really do anything. I mean, it might do something if it was Moses telling you, but even still, these guys hang out with Moses all the time. Moses does more than tell Joshua to be courageous. He gives him something that will enable him to be courageous. Did you hear what I said? He doesn't just tell him to be courageous. He gives him something. Do you know what that thing is? He gives him the gospel. Now, what do you mean he gives him the gospel? How does he give him the gospel? Well, what was Joshua's name before Moses changed it? You forgot already? Oshea, right? Oshea in the Hebrew, the name Oshea means the prayer of salvation. The what? The prayer of salvation. When Moses changes his name from Oshea to Joshua, Joshua means the promise of salvation. Did you catch that? It's one thing to, to send them out and say, hey, you've got a prayer in succeeding. You know, there's a chance that you could do this. It's another thing altogether to say to them, victory here is promised. There is a promise of salvation, not just a prayer of salvation. Moses goes to Oshea and says, hey, son, listen, this is the hardest thing that you're ever going to have to do. You're going to stand before literal giants, but listen, you can be victorious. You don't just have a prayer of victory. You have a promise of victory. And this name, Joshua, the promise of salvation, eventually as it passes and passes through the Greek, becomes the name Jesus, he who would save us from our sins, the promise of salvation, the gospel. And so before he sends him out and just taps him on the shoulder, he gives him this gospel message and says, now be of good courage because salvation is promised. 
I believe that Moses does this because Moses knows well that there is no courage available to man outside of the promises of God. You cannot just fire yourself up to do the work of the Lord. First of all, you have to be set on fire by the word of the Lord, and then you can go. Then there can be courage. I couldn't put it any better than Ellen White when she says in Ministry of Healing, so with all the promises of God's word, in them, the promises, he is speaking to us individually, speaking as directly as if we could listen to his voice. It is in these promises that Christ communicates to us his grace and his power. They are the leaves from that tree which is for the healing of the nations. Received and assimilated, they are to be the strength of character, the inspiration and sustenance of life. Nothing else can have such healing power. Nothing besides them can impart the courage and the faith which will give vital energy to the whole being. The promises of God are paramount to being a courageous people. You see, when the enemy comes to me and tempts me to forget who I am, I remember when the Lord spoke through the prophet Isaiah, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When the enemy comes and tries to get me to fix my mind on the future and that which I have no control, I remember when the Lord spoke through the prophet Isaiah and said, when you passeth through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walketh in the midst of fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not kindle upon you. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. When I'm tempted to forget of the way that God thinks of me, I remember when he spoke through the prophet Isaiah, since you were precious in my sight, you have been honorable, and I love you. And when Satan tries to bring up the sins of my past and remind me of who I used to be instead of who God has now made me, I remember when God spoke to the prophet Isaiah saying, Lo, I, even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions, and I will remember your sins no more. Now, are you telling me that, that, the, that the enemy can come to me in those times and tempt me in those times when the promises of God are on my lips and I will still fall? Surely not. Surely not. The promises of God are our mighty fortress. And I believe that these promises have too low an estimation amongst our young people. I feel that the Scriptures do not hold the lofty position of which they deserve. The enemy has confounded and bedazzled our minds with entertainment, all forms of entertainment that sap away from us the time and energy that is required to wrestle with the Word of God and to learn and claim those same promises. Friends, I believe that the Word of God and the Word of God alone has the power to change the heart, the power to transform the mind, the power to bring victory where previously there has only been defeat, the power to elevate the soul to levels it has not yet gone to, the power to take a life drenched in sin and work a complete transformation so that you and I barely even recognize that per person. That's the power of God, the Word of God, the promises of our Lord. Our young people are faced with obstacles today, challenges that even my generation knows not of. But too often, because they have either not yet been armed with these promises or have not seen the value in them, these temptations are met with cowardice instead of courage. Spine and spirit 
traded for peace and harmony. But this is no real peace. We are to meet our enemies, to meet our temptations with undaunted courage. We do not hear of courage too much. It's not a very 2021 word, right? Courage. In Hebrew, the word courage is kozak. It means to be strong. It means to be sure, to make something hard, and an even less popular definition, to be a man. You see, these traits, strength, surety, hardness, manliness, these are not traits that are really encouraged or valued any longer within modern society. We would much rather our men display general feministic qualities. We would much rather they be agreeable than affirmative. We would much rather they be docile and amenable and malleable as opposed to adventurous and valiant and courageous. And so especially to my young men today, I say this, rise as men. Be strong. Be of good courage. Do not shy away from strength. Use your strength to lift up those that are weak. Do not shy away from success and leadership. Instead, set an example of how Christ approached those things. And do not think that it is not manly to be spiritual, because there is nothing more spiritual than a gentleman who is surrendered to the power and the love of his Savior. Joshua and Caleb were undauntedly courageous. When they saw the giants, they saw mere tiny obstacles which were to be overcome. Sister White says, That two, however, of the twelve had viewed the land and reasoned otherwise to the group. They said, we are well able to overcome it. They urged the people, counting, listen to this, counting that God's promise was superior to giants, to walls, and to chariots of iron. The promises. The promises are what kept Joshua and Caleb going. And in actuality, the promises are what kept them alive. But you see, the people wouldn't have this. They decided to stand with the ten that brought back the unfavorable report. And you might be tempted into thinking, well, that was the logical choice. After all, ten people gave one report and two gave another. So maybe it wasn't rebellious, maybe it was just cautious. And then, of course, the spirit of prophecy comes and tosses that idea away. Because she says, if only the two men had brought the evil report, and all the ten had encouraged them to possess the land in the name of the Lord, they would still have taken the advice of the two in preference to the ten because of their wicked unbelief. It was not the majority. It was because they were doubting in the promises of God that had been passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation to this very specific moment. When the rubber came to the road, cowards were found instead of courageous men. Once again, we find what had started off in the Garden of Eden. The people of God are placed in a position where they either adhere to the promises of God or trust in fallen creatures. And so when you read on in the story, you'll find that the people, they cry the whole night. They just, they give up, and they just moan and groan and cry the entire evening away. What fools we often are. To stir up worry within our own souls when the promises of God are within our own reach. To put the promises of God to the side in acts of cowardice because the reality is that many of us are simply too afraid. We're too afraid to actually put our complete trust in God because we're afraid of the sacrifices that might be required. And so they repeat the pattern that you and I have repeated time after time. Hope, but distrust. And distrust leading to murmuring, and murmuring leading to rebellion. In chapter 14 and verse 9, 6, sorry, Joshua and Caleb, they stand. 
It says, but Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, the land we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. And if the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only, they say, do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land. For they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Friends, I doubt that there has ever been a time more than in this generation where acceptance is more desired than truth. As youth today, we want to be accepted regardless of the cost. We want to be liked both in the digital world and in reality. We want to be peacekeepers, but in actuality, we're clothing ourselves with this false sense of peace. Christ did not come to bring peace. Christ came to divide mother from daughter, father from son. Christ came to divide friends if that's what it would take. What was it that she said? If unity and peace, if they are to be accomplished at the sacrifice of truth, then let there be what? Let there be war. And so, young people, I put this to you. Do you truly love Jesus? Because Jesus is truth, the way, the truth, and the life. So do you love Jesus, yes or no? Then you're admitting that you must also love truth. Are you willing to stand before your friends, and in some cases even against your friends, in defense of truth? This is courage. This is courage. It's not that rock climbing is courage or asking a girl out on a date is courage. Everyone can do that within reason. <laughs> True courage is when you hear the Word of God or the principles of truth being mocked at school and so you take a stand. True courage is when you see the weak and the misfortunate being abused, and so you take a stand. And courage is taking those stands, even if it means losing friendships, even if it means being shunned, even if it means being ostracized. Joshua and Caleb were ready to lose their life for the truth. And the people were almost willing to do it. They had gathered stones together to quieten the voice because this is what happens. When you stand up for truth, you become a vessel of the Holy Spirit that He uses to convict. And conviction can be taken one way or the other. It can be taken and assimilated and received and cause the person to change or the opposite result. They want you gone to quieten the voice. When their own brothers were acting the fool, disbelieving the words and the promises of God, they tore their clothes in disgust. They stood before the people, and they encouraged them to turn back to the Lord. If you love Jesus, that too is your calling. That's courage. Would you choose to stand up for God and for truth, even at the cost of your own family. That's courage. And what I love about this whole thing, this, this idea of being of good courage, is it's, it's epidemical, it's contagious, it just catches on. Not only in this story, but there's this, there's this knock-on effect. You see, later in, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, when Moses comes to the realization that he's not going into the promised land, he looks to Joshua, the new leader, and what does he say to him? He says, be of good courage, be strong and of good courage, for thou must go with this people into the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit inherited. And, and why should you have courage? He says in the next verse, and the Lord 
He is the one that goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you. Neither will He forsake you. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Wherever there is, wherever there is this, this command or this charge to go forth and be courageous, it is always coupled with a reminder that behind that is the promise of God because that's where the power comes to actually be courageous in the first place. It's not a personality. It's a decision. So Joshua takes these words. Moses dies, and they get to the borders of Canaan. And in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, he stands before his people now, daunted at what lays before them, the great walls of Jericho, remembering when he stood before great walls outside of Canaan the last time, that Moses said to him, hey, Joshua, be strong and be of good courage. So now in Joshua 1, 9, Joshua stands up, sword and shield in hand, and he says to his people, have I not commanded you? Be strong and be of good courage. Do not be afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee wherever you go. Joshua, having been encouraged by Moses, now uses those exact same words to encourage his people, but also gives them the exact same reason to take courage, because the promises of God are with them. Now, if you go to 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 12, David sends Joab, his servant, to help his people as they battle against Ammon and Syria. And what do you think Joab, when he stands before the men, says? He says in 2 Samuel 10, verse 12, Be of good courage, and let us be men for our people and for the cities of our God, and the Lord will do to himself what he seems good. Later in that chapter, it says that everything that Joab said and did makes its way back to David. And so now at the end of David's life, on his deathbed, again, one of the most pivotal points in the history of this nation, he sits down with his son in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 20. And it says, And David said to Solomon his son, Be strong and be of good courage. Fear not nor be dismayed. For the Lord thy God, even my God, will be with you, and he will not fail you. He will not forsake you until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. This saying is consistently passed down throughout the ages whenever God's people faced obstacles that human eyes see as impossible to overcome. Accompanied by the promises of God so that those messages that were given were not just mere messages of morality or goodness, but they were message of divine substance. Friends, when it seems as though you're stuck in the pits of discouragement and surrounded by the great walls of Satan and the iron chariots of darkness, it is then when we must take great courage. It is when we cannot see God, not when we can, but it is when it is only His promises are available to us. It is then when we must show courage. This was the same experience of the disciples, by the way, when they were wandering aimlessly in the sea without their Messiah, without their Master, in the darkness of the night. Peter looks out and sees this figure that he thinks could actually be Jesus. And when he calls out to him, Master, is it you? What does Jesus say back to him? He says, be of good cheer. And do not be afraid, it is I. In the Greek, be of good cheer is also written of, as be of good courage. Even Jesus, with this message being passed down through his own lineage, stands at a time when people cannot truly see their God. He says, listen, now is the time when you're not even sure that it's me to take courage. Take courage, for I am with you. Be of good cheer, it is I. Friends, this evening, the message that I give you is, is a simple one. Courage. Claim the promises of God as though they were specifically said to you, because they are. Right now, we stand on the borders of heavenly Canaan. 
And God has sent His people out to survey the land. And yes, there are great walls. Yes, there are giants in the land. Yes, there are great chariots. But we serve a mighty God. His promises are sure. His people can be victorious. We can hold on to His word. We can claim His promises as our own. We can put our trust in Him. As we stand on the tips of eternity, young people today, I tell you, it is your duty, not just an option, to take courage, to stand on the promises of God. This and this alone is where victory is found. Stand for the principles of truth and of righteousness, even if it means standing in the most difficult of places. Stand with your brothers and sisters. Encourage them that they may have something to pass down, that they may be able to encourage others. Rise, rise to the occasion. Go onward, Christian soldiers, and be of good courage. Amen.